We're going, we're live. <laughs> live on the internet. Um, welcome everyone to Automated Strike Zone Perspectives on the Technology and How It May Affect the Game. Uh, before we get started again, huge thanks to everybody at Sabre for, this has been an amazingly smooth conference despite all the difficulties and the live streaming and uh, hats off to them. Uh, first, our panelists, Bobby Evans. Bobby, can you raise your hand? There's Bobby. Uh, after graduating from, and I hope, this, I got this from Wikipedia, Bobby, I hope this is correct. Uh, uh -huh. After graduating from the University of North Carolina, Bobby worked in the commissioner's office for three years. He went to work for the Giants in 1994 and served as the Giants general manager from 2015 through 2018 season. Uh, ben, Ben Jedlovec, known Ben for a long time. Ben is the director of engineering data quality for Major League Baseball. Ben, someday you'll have to tell me exactly what that means. Uh, previously, Ben was the president of Baseball Info Solutions and um, was the co-author of volumes three and four of the beloved Fielding Bible, volume five, uh, is just now coming out, by the way. I've got it at my, at my house, and it's great. Recommend it. And sitting here to my left is Wayne Griner, the president of Quality of Pitch uh, Baseball. So welcome, everybody. Um, automated strike zone. It's been a hot topic for a long time. Um, why is it a topic? Well, it's a topic because human beings are imperfect. Right? Depending on which metric you look at, umpires miss between 5 and 10% of called pitches. Some people are shocked by that number, but the great majority of those missed, put that in quotes, pitches are on the edges and would be missed by, could be missed by anyone, um, even the greatest umpires in the world, which is basically who we're seeing on the field. And I suspect that if we had perfect measurement, the figures would be even lower than five or 10%. Um, that said, with the uh, ability of our technology, existing technology, the cameras, um, when umpires do miss pitches or when they seem to miss pitches, um, it becomes a story. Um, we probably all remember uh, young Brennan Miller uh, and Aaron Boone last July. Um, if the Nationals had not won the World Series uh, last fall, the, the 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 plate umpire in Game Five would have been a big uh, would be a big story now. Um, not that the, either of those umpires ne necessarily had bad games, but there was a perception, and when you have a perception that an umpire is having a rough game or misses a big pitch, um, we're always gonna come back to why are human beings doing this? And we can get into why human beings do it um, um, at length, but the discussion isn't going to go away. Um, so in the short term, what have we seen? Uh, last summer in the second half of the season, um, the Atlantic League used an automated strike zone. Uh, the Arizona Fall League um, right here in Phoenix, use the automated strike zone, I believe in one ballpark for two mm -hmm. teams, or maybe it's two ballparks, but um, it, it, it's, it's, we've seen it. There's a lot of data now, and I think Ben can speak to this. Um, there's a lot of data on how well it works. So Ben, I would like to start with you, um, just your, your sort of um, executive summary of the implementation to this point and the technology that's used for the automated strike zone. Sure. Well, thanks for having me, everybody, and and thanks for uh, you know to Saber as as you said at the beginning, Rob, just for continuing to host this event in light of recent events and everything. And, um, you know, I would say uh, on this topic in particular, the automated strike zone is an interesting one, given um, just how far the technology has evolved in really just the last like three to five years. Um, you know, we, we're at the place where we can have this conversation and it's a realistic uh, possibility uh, for the not too distant future. And, 
uh, you know, that's just a testament to the technology industry overall. And, and we at Major League Baseball are, you know, going to try to uh, continue to use technology to improve the games, uh, not just the, you know, kind of the accuracy of the on the field product, but also the experience for the fans. And this is one of those areas where, uh, you know, consistency is, is desired, and, you know, it's, uh, and the umpires do a tremendously, uh, a tremendously good, great job, a uh, consistent job uh, as a whole. But if there's ways that we can make uh, kind of improve the product, then we're certainly certainly going to take a look at them. And um, you know, as mentioned at the at the top, it's uh, the technology has really put us in a place where we can have this conversation and really explore kind of the the edge cases and the the intangibles and the human elements that uh, that could be impacted by such a technological change. Ben, can you describe the actual hardware that's that that's been used to, to this point? Uh, sure. You know, it's it's really kind of two separate components, right? There's there's one component that is uh, involved in tracking the baseball and calibrating that to the field of play and then to the strike zone specifically. Um, and you can use, you know, there's a number of different technologies out there that are capable of tracking a baseball in real time uh, and providing information about where that pitch was. Was it in the in the strike zone or not? Um, and there's a lot of details around, you know, whether you use, we're going with, uh, uh, as, as a lot of you probably heard in the presentation on Friday, and if you didn't, you should check out the, uh, the live stream uh, that Greg Kane and Clay uh, uh, Nunnally, uh, that, are, that is archived on YouTube by Saber now. Um, it's a great overview of the Hawkeye system that we're putting in at the major league level. And, and so that is certainly one of the technologies that can be used to uh, power the ball tracking component of this. And then the other part of it that probably gets overlooked is just how do you get that message? How do you get that ball or strike, you know, binary outcome relayed to the umpire in real time so that he can make a, a, a call and he can actually relay the call to the players and to the fans and everybody else uh, without disrupting the flow of the game. So there's a lot of different, you know, that's, that's one of the areas where we've probably spent the most time, um, you know, given the technological improvements on the ball tracking side, we spent a lot of our time really focusing on just how to get that uh, that message um, from from the tracking system to the umpire in, in a you know preferably a headphone of some kind, um, and so we've tried a few different uh, ways of doing that from iPods in their pockets and uh, and that are connected to Wi-Fi where the the message gets transmitted via Wi-Fi through a, a mobile app, um, and uh, and then that relays it to a headphone that they have in their ear that just says ball or strike and. And the umpire uh, makes the call accordingly. After, of course, you know, uh, considering the other elements beyond just whether the pitch was in the strike zone or not, did the batter swing, and in all of those elements that are still in play, uh, that the umpire's got to make, uh, you know, uh, his job's actually changing and becoming hard in different ways now, because uh, he has to kind of think, he has to process uh, the information in his ear with the information that he sees differently than he has historically. Now, but I want to establish a, a sort of context. And Ben, you're free to abstain if you like, but Bobby and Wayne, um, at least, um, and I'm going to participate too, uh, could you just raise your hand if you think we will see an automated strike zone in Major League Baseball within the next five seasons? Yeah, I'm going to abstain from this one. You're going to so abstain. Okay, how about me, the next don't count three me as seasons? A yeah. <laughs> Hopefully. Just one, at, I'm the only one in the next three. Okay, that's interesting. Um, so, um, Bobby, what do you see as the limits of the implementation, which is to say you don't, you don't think it's going to happen within the next three years, perhaps? Uh, what do you think? Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's probably three to four years. I think that probably three years of working its way into minor league games and working out all the particulars to, you know, and it, it, is, it is another element of negotiation with the umpires union. Uh, so... I think that there's enough hurdles that it'll probably take at least three years, and but certainly by five years we should be able to see the technology in major league games on a, on a regular basis. And I, uh, I think that it's really just the amount of of getting uh, players, clubs, and the technology you know ready, uh, along with the the logistics. Um, I think that certainly uh, we're going to see it soon. Wayne. Yeah, I think uh, what might delay it slightly, as Ben has already mentioned, is the uh, the switch from TrackMan over to Hawkeye. I'm sure MLB wants to see how that's going to to all you know work and and maybe proceed a little more cautiously that way. But definitely, it's coming. And uh, yeah, we from a QOP or quality of pitch perspective, 
um, you know, we are already using an automated strike zone within our um, algorithm, so we would uh, embrace that if that is brought to light. Now, Ben, I don't know to what degree you're able to speak to this, but the, 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 when I've talked to people about this, including uh, a longtime Major League umpire, um, one of his concerns is, or the question he has, is, is about pitches that, according to the rule book, are certainly strikes, but they're just simply not called strikes because nobody would buy it. The umpire can't sell it. The batter's not going to believe it. Uh, the managers aren't going to believe it. Um, have you sort of thought about that question? Um, and how, you know, there was a famous example, um, and I, I thought that it, it went pretty smoothly in the Atlantic League last year. I think everybody, there was pretty good buy-in from most of the players and umpires and, and coaching staffs. I, I recall there was one incident where a player was ejected uh, for arguing because a strike was called on a ball that essentially or nearly landed in the dirt. It was just a, it was a, a breaking ball that clipped probably the very front edge of the strike zone as it was going down. Mm -hmm. And that's a tough one. Um, and um, uh, so that, that's the, one of the reservations that, that people at, in, at the major league level at least seem to have. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And that's, that's something we've spent a lot of time thinking about and, and trying to understand the human element and the kind of the differences and the impact that this change might have, uh, good or bad, and, and trying to make sure that, uh, that we can align this and implement this in a way that's only going to be a positive for the game. Um, so the, there's all sorts of things you can do. I mean, you can, uh, you can theoretically like look at changing the rules of what the strike zone is supposed to be. And it's, it's, you know, relatively trivial. I mean, my colleagues who, who are doing the programming for this are probably going to debate this a little bit, but it's relatively trivial to change a couple lines of code to redefine the, the, uh, the elements of the, the, the exact uh, dimensions of the strike zone. If, if you want to, uh, you know, find a strike zone that better aligns with uh, the expectations and kind of the historical aspect of, of what uh, strike zone has been called. So, you know, really, this is an area where technology uh, makes things possible that, um, you know, previously have, have not been possible to get a consistent strike zone across the league, uh, regardless of what park or what umpire or batter or pitcher or anything else. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, we, we want to make sure that we implement that in a way that makes the game better for all involved. And uh, Bobby, I think this is, uh, gets back to what you were talking about in terms of transitioning. Um, you could certainly cut off, say, the front two inches of the plate if not physically, uh, in terms of what the actual strike zone is, 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 is how it's being read. But there have got to be unintended consequences when you, when you change the strike zone that you cannot foresee until you actually do it. Um, and I think maybe that's sort of your point. When you have enough data from the Atlantic League or the minor leagues, perhaps then you can at least get a, begin to get a feel for what sort of effects that, that you'd have in the majors if you did that. Yeah, and I, I, I have, let me be clear. I think this is moving, you know, very quickly. I mean, I think that just the progress with the Atlantic League, the progress with the Arizona Fall League, and I think the technology is, is incredibly, you know, Ben can speak to this better than I, incredibly close or, or virtually ready. I think there's just a lot of other mechanisms that need to get, you know, clarified and cleared in order to actually implement it. Uh, but, you know, as soon as we start seeing it in Major League Spring Training, uh, yeah, I think that'll really be the final testing ground uh, and again, whether they whether they implement this throughout minor league baseball uh, after the fact or before the fact, you know, we'll have some bearing on this as well. But I, I do think that the technology is going to give us as true a strike zone as I think anybody could want. And I, you know, cutting off two inches, yeah, I mean that's you know that's going to be another debate, you know. And again, I don't know that ultimately the technology necessarily requires that. I mean, Ben can again speak to that as well. Wayne, have you have you been able to notice a systematic difference between the strike zone in the rule book and the strike zone as it's actually called on the field? Because that's really what we're talking yeah. about here. That's where the change would come if the strike zone isn't officially changed. Right. Yeah, so what, um, we introduced our QOP metric back at this conference five years ago, 2015. So we've been calculating uh, Major League Baseball pitch quality now for the last five years. And after calculating over 700,000 pitches per year, going back now all the way to 08, we have over 10 million pitches where we've been able to calculate the quality. And we use six different measurements within our algorithm. So four that are movement-based, but then 
obviously location and velocity are extremely important. So as we look specifically at that location coefficient, uh, it's been interesting to see what's happened over the last number of years. So it appears back in the mid-90s, you know, over the last 20 years, that some umpires, maybe not all of them, are granting that strike call to those balls that we know are, are low or even below the strike zone the way it should be called. So um, really interesting to see that that's happened and some pitchers have definitely taken advantage of that. And just one example I could give you would be a guy like Justin Verlander who has above average command on all of his different pitch types but also is exceptional when it comes to vertical break on all his pitches. So there's an example of a guy that has a reputation for being around the strike zone. Um, he is granted a lot of strike calls being around the plate but he ha does have a lot of pitches that end up actually being below the strike zone and still getting the strike call. So somebody like that might be penalized a little bit with an automated strike zone. Now, could Justin Verlander adapt? Of course he could. But we're seeing right now there's one example of a pitcher that could be affected by this type of implementation. And, and I've seen a, uh, a study showing Clayton Kershaw getting a number of close pitches uh, called in his favor, presumably because he has such great stuff. And uh, Ben, um, have you seen, you, I know MLB uh, StatCast measures something called nasty factor, and it seems to me that the nastier the pitch, the harder it is to call. Have you noticed that sort of effect? Um, I don't know that we've, uh, at least I don't, I don't think I've personally studied the, the nasty factor. I mean, I know we've done an anal analysis of um, different pitch types in certain locations and, and uh, tried to evaluate, you know, kind of the differences between the strike zones there. And, you know, we've got a long history of, uh, you know, just kind of evaluating umpires and, and tracking their progress and, and helping train umpires around the strike zone and such. Uh, and so there's a, there's a lot of data we've been tracking on that front. And, um, but again, it comes down to, you know, what is the, uh, what is the best uh, compromise or best uh, style of play, best strike zone that uh, for for the whole game moving forward? Is it is it something closer to the rule book strike zone? Is it or is it does that need to be potentially adjusted uh, to align with historical preference or or something else? Well, and it, it certainly seems to me that I mean, essentially this is a zero sum game. You would have some winners, some losers. Bobby, uh, maybe you could speak to that generally. The sorts of pitchers that you might be looking for if the strike zone was enforced precisely as it's in the rule book. Um, and also, uh, uh, we have a question from the audience. Would you worry about veterans having uh, an adjustment period versus young players who had worked with this in the minor leagues and in the Arizona Fall League, places like that? I think it's going to be an adjustment for pitchers immensely just from the, stack, the, the fact that they, they so much you know, want to be on the, the edge of the plate. They want to get as little of the plate as they can to, to hopefully create enough deception where one, it's either taken for a strike or, or, or two, it, it's enough um, out of the zone or deception that they get a swing and miss. So I think that, you know, when the strike zone is really fine and, and, and mechanical and, and there's really no, no gray area, uh, you know, by, by way of technology, yeah, I think it's going to be an adjustment for pitchers to, you know, to really, you know, they're going to need to get that swing and miss because they're not going to get that that called strike, you know, just outside the zone that that the Brandon Belt, who's maybe the best umpire in uniform, um, you know, as a, as a hitter, uh, that just won't swing at it. And so they're going to have to they're going to have to find um, uh, a way to, you know, the, the, as far as their stuff to to create the deception, whether that's you know whether that's in velocity or deception in, in angle or deception in, in overall movement and stuff uh, because, you know, you're not going to get those those edgy strikes that you've been getting. And that, you know, that, I think that's not necessarily unique for the veteran. I mean, certainly will be an adjustment for the veteran at the big league level and not getting strikes that they've gotten. But even for the minor league player that's getting his first big league call up, he's been getting those calls in the minor league. So he's going to have to work in a much tighter zone, and it, and it may really benefit the hitter. Wayne? Yeah, I think, you know, if this gets implemented, this automatic strike zone, what we would want to monitor and find very interesting is, you know, at present, most MLB pitchers go through early in the game feeling out the umpire. You know, they're trying to determine what is the strike zone going to be today. So most pitchers are going to, you know, be slightly off the plate, see if they get the call, and if they do, 
they're going to take more liberties and obviously try and expand the strike zone, which only makes sense. Once that exercise is futile and there's no need to go through that process anymore, what we would anticipate is a lot of pitchers, especially those that have been successful working ahead in the count, could be much more aggressive. And what they could do is, is pound the zone earlier in counts, but not just that, but actually rely more on their primary pitches rather than going to their secondary pitch types. Now, what is that going to do through the course of the game? You know, are we going to see pitchers, if that's the strategy they have to take, maybe now they are getting three times through the batting order, they may be forced to only get two times through the batting order. We might be going to the bullpens earlier. We might have more openers, not fewer openers to start game. All of those kind of ramifications. So um, I think it's going to be really interesting to see how aggressive pitchers would be. And then the flip side of that is, are the hitters going to be more aggressive? Knowing that some pitchers are going to have to pound the strike zone. Instead of throwing around the strike zone, they're going to have to throw more in the strike zone. And will hitters take advantage of that? So it's a give and take. It's a back and forth. Who's going to adapt the best to determine the pitch outcome? I, I referenced unintended consequences earlier. Well, this isn't a, exactly unintended or intended, but it's certainly a consequence. Uh, we have been uh, probably every uh, analytics conference that I've attended, or nearly all of them, there has been a presentation about pitch framing, which has been such a popular subject. Um, First in this sort of setting, and not long afterward, actually in Major League Baseball, with in, where, when you could measure it, um, that's presumably going to go away completely. Pitch framing is, I would assume, utterly irrelevant. Mm -hmm. um, Bobby, how do you feel about that? If you're building a team, all of a sudden, uh, that particular skill, which we've come to think is so important, all of a sudden is meaningless. Uh, uh, what does that do to your roster construction? or your player development? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, of course, catch, catching frame, catcher framing has been in, in part of the game for forever. It's just been more recent that we've been able to actually measure it. Uh, so, it, you know, it, it is kind of something that's addictive. So you, you were going to miss it, uh, those of us who have depended on it. I, I will say that for the catcher, I think that that allows him to, you know, focus on other aspects of his game. I mean, he's really just receiving the ball and then, you know, making sure he's you know, holding runners, calling a good game. It just takes that element away. And there's really only so many guys that are really all that elite at it anyway. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think it's, a, um, it's, it's, yeah, it's kind of disappointing to lose that part of the game, but I think there's, there's enough going on back there that I think the catchers can then, you know, zone in on other parts of their game that are just as important and, and obviously will have more impact given that that won't be a factor. anymore. Well, and, and uh, it, it must be a bit, disorienting for catchers who are being trained, I, was, I would say as we speak, but nobody's being trained at this moment, but uh, for the last few years, catchers have been working a lot harder on framing, generally mm -hmm. speaking, than they used to, and they must be paying attention and realize that at some point in the not distant future, uh, that skill's not going to be all that useful, so I wonder if they're already having those thoughts. Uh, Rob, can I say something on sure, that? Sure, go ahead. Just from a pitch quality perspective, uh, the philosophy of, of what we do has always been to try and measure those things that the pitcher himself can control. And that's why, you know, an automated strike zone where uh, it's not a subjective decision by the umpire, the reason we would favor that is that's something that right now the pitcher can't control, but an automated uh, strike zone, he can control where he throws the baseball. Um, when it comes to the catcher, um, you know, what would the benefit to the pitcher that we would see is if he doesn't have to frame each pitch is, you know, later in the games, I'm not sure what the fatigue factor is when, pitcher, when catchers have to frame each and every pitch, but we would see the benefit, as Bobby said, uh, controlling the running game, you know, that catchers can get in a much better throwing position to receive the baseball. Therefore, they're going to control the running game much better, which would benefit the pitcher. But also things like later in games, blocking balls in the dirt, you know what I mean? Which is going to be a huge benefit to the pitcher. Um, but even things like fielding their position, you know, if they don't have to frame pitches throughout the game, you know, later in the ball game when that hitter lays down that bunt and they can field it in a better position and throw, throw the runner out, that's again, huge benefit. So 
I'm not sure what the fatigue factor is for framing, but it's something that would be very interesting to look at if we go to an automated strike zone. Well, and the overarching effect, presumably, is that well, catchers will hit better. Yeah, exactly. They won't be as tired, and they certainly just, they simply won't be chosen because they're good pitch framers. Yeah. Uh, there, are, there, there have been some catchers in the last 10 or 20 years who would not be allowed to catch in today's game yeah. because their framing has been measured as, right. as being mm -hmm. too poor. Um, uh, by the way, if anybody has questions here in the audience, there are cards in the back. Uh, if you're watching on our streaming channel, you can pop into the chat and send those along, and I, and I, will, I will see them. Um, ben, this is for you. I can't speak to the veracity of the account because I haven't read about it, but maybe you can respond. Um, in the Atlantic League last season, when this was first introduced, there were some players who had very big strike zones um, as they lied about their height. Uh, I mean, obviously, that it sort of... They, they didn't want the big strike zone, but there certainly are players who are not as tall as their listed height. Um, what other human factors might influence the system? And uh, Bob, you're well, free to speak to this too. Uh, sure, yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's an area we've looked at uh, pretty closely and just trying to, to set the strike zone, uh, the tops and the bottom. I, um, you know, without getting into specifics, I think that's something, uh, another area just kind of doubling back to the the previous, uh, the, the initial conversation is uh, that's something that I think, you know, there's a rule book definition of the top and the bottom of the strike zone. And then there's a, a practical definition as well. And, um, you know, it's something that uh, we're going to continue to study very closely and try to find out what's the, what's the right strike zone for the game going forward, you know, the, to strike the right balance that's appealing to fans and uh, works for players and coaches and umpires and everybody else. Um, so that's a, an, you know, area of ongoing discussion and, and evaluation. Yeah, I mean, I think that from a from a you know front office player development coaching staff you know player perspective, I mean, I think once it's clearly established and and defined, I think everyone will get used to it. I mean, I you know again, you do have you do have a defined strike zone in the in the rule book, and as long as the technology will allow to read the you know the appropriate zone based on the hitter that's at the plate. I think just as the umpire has to read it, I would assume that you know, the technology would. And I think, it, again, it'll, it'll ultimately be an advantage uh, as people get used to it. So I have a question here, and it, it says for Ben, but I, this is a question for the whole panel, everybody in the audience, every baseball fan, really. Um, and and, uh, and I, I, Ben, I don't know if you can speak to this directly, um, but, but um, we'll start with you. Um, and it, for me, it is the single most interesting question around this subject. Um, I will ask the question and then I'll, I'll give a little context. Has MLB considered using the automated strike zone to generate a specific style of play or could it adjust on the fly? And I think the, what the, the general uh, question here is, can MLB make a decision that, and now we're getting into my own personal preferences and biases, but result in fewer strikeouts, fewer home runs, more batted balls in play, um, a greater diversity of events? Um, most of the people that I talk to would like to see that. I suspect that both Ben and Bobby and Wayne would like to see that. Mm -hmm. I know there are people out there who would love to see the game be mostly home runs and strikeouts. None of them are my friends, but I do know they're out there. Um, and to me, an automated strike zone seems like a wonderful opportunity mm -hmm. to move toward a different, and in my opinion, better style of play. Um, it's not at all clear to me that A, Major League Baseball, or the Players Association have the, the will or the ability to, to, to move in that direction in a concerted fashion um, because of both the politics involved and also, again, unintended consequences. Can you really model all these different factors to arrive at 10% more ground balls? I don't know, um, <laughs> which is why I'm asking the question. So Ben, we'll start with you, and I know you might be limited in what you can say about internal discussions, but please uh, 
lead us off. Yeah, I mean, without uh, without being without being too specific on on this, I think your your question gets right at the mindset that is uh, that is very important to us. And I think we we as an organization, the commissioner has set some some uh, organization goals, and you know, one of them is relates to the uh, use of technology to improve the game, whether that's just the uh, the product on the field or or really just the experience for fans. Um, you know, how they interact with the game, how they consume games, whether it's watching them live or consuming data and statistics or or other content around the game those are these are all priorities for the league and so you know we we certainly see technology um, you know baseball has a strong history with technology we've been tracking things in baseball dating back to you know Henry Chadwick's box scores and so we've been tracking data uh, and have a lot of things uh, kind of going for us historically and we're going to continue that into this next generation of technology and and continue to study them as best you can and, and carefully of course you know it's you, you uh, I think your point about unintended consequences, I think May Wayne mentioned as well, is uh, is well taken, and and that's why you know we do the the uh, the partnership with the Atlantic League. I think is a really interesting one, uh, where uh, they've been great partners in, in letting uh, kind of experimenting with some new rules, some ideas, um, and and cooperating with uh, Major League Baseball in that way, and giving the players a chance to get exposed to some of these ideas and. Uh, kind of getting their feedback from the from the players and the coaches, the feedback that can help guide us towards uh, making the product at the major league level better. And uh, you know, look, looking at you know, going back a couple of questions ago, we uh, we were talking about catcher framing becoming a diminished value. But if you you also consider uh, one of the rules in play in the Atlantic League last year was the the step off rule on pickoff throws, requiring that uh, both lefties and righties step off the rubber before they commit a pickoff throw. Uh, all of it, you know, we, and if you look at the data from the Atlantic League last year, you saw a significant something on the order of 50% increase in stolen bases per game. Uh, you know, all of a sudden, you've just answered your question about how do you, you know, what is it, what is a catcher going to do anymore? Uh, we're going to have a different kind of player as a catcher defensively going forward. Well, there you go. Now, all of a sudden, the running game is a lot more important than it was uh, previously if you start considering the impact of those sorts of rules. And so, um, so you know, what we can do with technology, I think the commissioner has been uh, very proactive in kind of considering how technology can improve the game going forward, uh, building upon the success of instant replay and, and other such things. Bobby, do you think that, uh, first of all, can, do you think that uh, um, it's possible to sort out all these different consequences to arrive at, a, at an end point? And second, uh, do you think it's something that, that the, the players would be, could be on board with eventually? I mean, anytime you're you're changing the strike zone, I mean, it's always going to have you know uh, a challenge to convince you know the players, coaches, those on the field, you know how that is an advantage or in the best interest of the game. I mean, they're going to have that's going to be a challenge for for them. But I think, but I think the reality is, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that once there is a change, and if it's something that you give a long enough period of time. It could have the desired outcome that you're you're looking for, uh, but the hitters will adjust. I mean, if you just if you just for example, the only change to the strike zone is that you now you add three inches on the outside part of the plate, you know, so hitters are just going to move closer to the plate, you know, so they're, they're going to adjust. I mean, depending on where that strike zone is, but again, I I think that doing a lot of uh, maneuvering of the strike zone, it, you know, you know, it has to be it has to be taken seriously and it's not something that you can change year to year. It's something that you, you know, again, there's already going to be a, a significant adjustment to the technology, uh, you know, directing the, the call of strike or ball. Um, so the, you know, the, the adjustment of the strike zone in different directions up and down and outside inside. I mean, those are as much as they may give desired outcomes, they're not going to be overly excited by that on the field, just because again, they're used to a strike zone for, you know what, you know what consistency they have now with the, the umpires, whether it be at the minor league or major league level. And Bobby, uh, I would assume that that this would have to be negotiated with the players. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, you know, all all major league on-field rules are considered, uh, you know, something that the commissioner again he has some unilateral uh, power, but. You know, all those rules at, at some level enter into negotiation uh, from the commissioner's office and the players' union. But anytime it involves, you know, the umpires as well, there's obviously, you know, discussion now. Of course, once there's automated 
strike zone, and that's been settled with the umpires union, the adjustment of that uh, strike zone won't has much impact on the umpire himself. It'll then just be really between the union and the commissioner's office. So uh, here's one from the audience. Um, how will the automated strike zone affect player and manager interactions with umpires? And uh, I think clear, I want to expand that and, and, and wonder uh, how this would affect the pace of play. We're presumably going to have fewer arguments about balls and strikes or fewer step outs or while, the, while the batter says something under his breath, but would this improve pace of play? Do you have any data on that just from the the uh, Atlantic League, Ben? Um, I'm sure that we've looked at that. I don't recall the the answer on that, um, but uh, but I you know I think there's merit to the the idea at least that it could improve pace of play in terms of that. Um, I think uh, we learned last year in the Atlantic League that it's not going to eliminate uh, challenging the umpires uh, even when on on ball and strike calls. Uh, there's some good YouTube videos of that, but. Um, it'll be interesting to kind of see how that that settles in with time uh, to see what the dynamic becomes. And, you know, it's uh, hopefully it's a more productive and constructive one, uh, building on the relationships they already have, which are overwhelmingly positive. Bobby, uh, I mean, I think we all, um, we have a sort of nostalgic vision of uh, arguments between umpires and managers in particular, often about balls and strikes. Um, obviously, there are a lot of nostalgic things that have gone away that we ultimately don't miss a whole lot. But uh, is this something that you would miss? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the human interaction is obviously is exciting part of the game and it has been for a long time. And I, yeah, I mean, it'll, it'll definitely be different. I guess, you know, instead of the fact that you'll have the ability to, to call or, you know, request a replay, maybe maybe there'll be the ability of the manager gets one opportunity during the game to ask that the technology be recalibrated, uh, you know, in between innings so that it's, you know, as accurate as possible, Ben. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure that the recalibration is once a year, maybe the umpires can, or the managers can get a chance to, to recalibrate once per series. I don't know. Rob, can I comment on that? Sure, go ahead, Wayne. Um, yeah, if, if you know, with Hawkeye now being in place, if let's say MLB went down the path of professional tennis, let's say, which already uses Hawkeye, uh, it's interesting how the chair umpire and the line umpires are making the call, right? Is the ball in or out? But then the players are allowed so many challenges, right, throughout the course of the game. So it'd be very interesting to just have an open mind and th see what that could look like for Major League Baseball if they did allow a coach or players, like we said, to have so many challenges throughout the course of the game on a ball or strike uh, call. So. Right. You know, I'll, I'll just add, like, you know, I, from a, from a ex, you know, personal experience, I remember in sixth grade, I was playing a basketball game and I, I drew my fifth foul without even touching an opposing player and was fouled out of the game as a result. Um, and I, you know, in, in sixth grade, you're not allowed to, uh, to pro, you know, argue with the referees all that much. And my dad was the coach. I'm pretty sure he wouldn't have allowed that anyways. But, you know, for me, that was actually a, I still remember that two decades later as a kind of a turning point in my, my basketball experience. And one of the reasons that I stopped playing basketball and uh, enjoying the game of basketball as much just because of uh, some of those frustrating moments like that. And, you know, this, that's why something like this is really an opportunity kind of, uh, uh, improve the game and, and to eliminate some of those frustrating moments. You don't, you don't, you don't want to remember that, uh, you know, a crucial call that made the difference in, in your game or your team season or that sort of thing. Uh, you want to, you want to see the players decide the outcome on the field in their own right. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, ben, a question from the audience. Um, do you foresee concerns um, about technical difficulties during a game, um, and it's you know there's an interesting, interesting dynamic that I'm just now considering, which is, what if the technology blinks out during a game and you your umpires have not spent the last x number of years training to call balls and strikes? Do you just stop the game until everything's back online? So what we do right now in the Atlantic League is if there's a some sort of malfunction, um, you know, especially given we don't have quite the full uh, infrastructure and support staff on hand at an Atlantic League game that we do at a Major League game, um, and uh, and and so if the technology has some sort of malfunction, 
uh, in the Atlantic League or somewhere else, you know, Salt River Field where we were testing it in the AFL last year, um, the umpire is empowered to make his own decision. Uh, and at this point, you know, that's not a, you know, the kind of the eventuality you're anticipating uh, hasn't become a reality where they're, they've forgotten how to call balls and strikes. I don't think that's a, uh, you know, immediate future concern, but I think it's something that uh, should be thought through. And, and of course, the um, kind of the fallback options, if there is a malfunction, if there's a, uh, if something else needs to prompt, uh, if there needs to be a, a you know, whatever the, whatever the, you know, 0.1% of the time there's a malfunction or less than that at this point with the tracking rates at the major league level, um, you know, thinking through the mechanics of that is certainly something we're, you know, getting more testing, more repetitions under our belt to get more experience to, to handle those situations better. Bobby, uh, you are at the moment uh, a neutral party. I want to give you the last word here. Uh, I think we agree that, that the automated strike zone is inevitable. It's coming. It's a matter of uh, when, not if. Um, I just really just want to get your take, having been in the game for so long. Do you think this is a good thing for the game long term? Um, and why or why not? I mean, I think it's 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 just an advantage that we 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 should you know we should you know give give every opportunity to be a part of our game. I think the fact that you could have a strike zone that is you know not with uh, human error, if you will, and as limited as that human error is now, the fact that you can eliminate that, I think that's an advantage to the game and and uh, should only make the game you know more exciting and better. I think that just as we have instant replay, really to just try to get you know, closer to that 100% mark on on the on the plays at hand. You know, to have a strike zone that's, you know, perhaps 100% accurate or 99.9% accurate. I mean, that's I think that's a desired outcome for for fans and and the players in the game. It does change things. It's not necessarily in a comfort zone for all of us, and it, there will be challenges, of course, whether that's with technology or or challenges with you know just establishing what that strike zone is and and players not getting uh, different strike zones in different ballparks. And, you know, they're supposed to be the same, but they're not. And, you know, I'm sure there'll be a process for, you know, making sure those adjustments are made and calibrated and, and functioning at a high level. And, you know, I think ultimately, you know, finding ways to, to get surefire uh, accuracy, I think is an advantage to the game. I think we can't forget, you know, how, you know, check swings, for example, are something that's currently not part of replay. It's currently not going to be affected by a strike zone. So there's other things in the game that are still going to have to be measured and they're still going to have challenges. But I think this is one that uh, we should look forward to in time. Bobby, Ben, Wayne, thank you for joining us. Thanks to Sabre for making all this work. This was great. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, guys.